Right, I'm going to be talking about strategic uh, business principles that we should be able to apply, not just to business, but to ministry as well. And I think people very often have the idea that business principles have nothing to do with ministry. I suggest to you that isn't the case. Um, of course, there's some areas in which ministry and business are different, but quite a lot of the ideas can transfer from one to the other. Jesus himself said, I must be about my father's business. Now, his father was a carpenter, uh, or at least his adoptive father, because, of course, Joseph wasn't his actual father. Um, but uh, so he, he looked at it in a business-like fashion. And I would suggest to you he used many examples of business uh, in uh, his parables. Um, the Bible tells us, for instance, uh, that uh, we should not deal with a slack hand. We should not abandon logic and accountability and or common sense. And sometimes, uh, perhaps, we're guilty of doing that. Uh, in Matthew, it tells us uh, we should be wise as servant, serpents and harmless as doves. Solomon uh, wrote the book of Proverbs, and it's full of suggestions and ideas which you can use in business and in ministry. Uh, I'll give you one example, uh, which I've used frequently in business. There's a scripture that says, a soft answer turns away anger. If you happen to be in customer relations, you better know about that. And I remember in many negotiations I've had with Japanese colleagues, I've used that very thing. Uh, when I uh, saw they were getting angry, we'd just try and calm it down and then you can get a rational decision out of it. So uh, there are so many suggestions. For instance, um, the prodigal son. The father was in business. He was running a farm. Um, the parable of the a servant who wouldn't forgive. It involved debts and debtors. Uh, that's uh, very familiar to anyone who's in, been in business. The parable of the sower involved a farmer. Uh, the parable of the landowner who went away and left his servants uh, running uh, the farm and came back to see what was going on. He was a landlord. I have a property business, so I know what it is to be a landlord and want to make sure the people look after the property. Then it says about building a tower and counting the cost. That's an accountant uh, or perhaps a builder as well. Um, and then uh, the parable of the various talent, ten talents, uh, you know, the ones who were given different talents, each of those were the, the one who never invested it at all. Uh, uh, Jesus said he should have at least put it with the bank and got some interest. Well, there's bankers right there and investments. So business uh, and uh, uh, ministry do have uh, a lot of interrelationships. Um, you know, one of the most important business principles I have, which I think is very important in the church as well, is the Bible tells us about keeping our word. Jesus said, let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. Uh, so when you say yes, mean yes, and when you say no, mean no. He says anything more than that, don't swear by uh, the Bible or heaven or earth. He just says, just when your yes is, means yes, and your no means no. And I think that's really important, the whole issue of keeping our word. And so I'm very careful about when I give my word. Uh, if I give my word and shake hands with somebody on a deal, that's it. You don't need a piece of paper. Um, in fact, I, I employed a former president of Vi uh, Bank of America once, and he showed me the document they give when they make a loan. And it was this thick and it had hundreds and hundreds of clauses of loan. And he said, actually, it's a completely worthless document. He says, there are only two things I need to know. One, is the guy going to be willing to repay? And two, is he going to be able to? So providing those two things are OK, you didn't need that big document. And I think this is a really important thing. Uh, years ago, it was said of the Englishman, he said, an Englishman's word is his bond. And sadly, that is not true anymore. And sadly, that's why we have all the corruption and problems in business, because people have lost the value of their word. The Bible tells us, 
He has exalted his word above his name. The Bible says he has a name that is above every name, and he's put his word above his name. So in other words, if his word is no good, his name is no good. The same applies to us, and that applies to ministry or business. And happily, uh, our business, we, we try and keep our word. I can't think of uh, any occasions where we haven't done what we said. But I'm very careful about who I give my word to. Um, and I think we should be cautious and careful. Uh, I think James talks about controlling our tongue. Be careful what we commit to. It's too easy to say something and say, oh yes, I'll do that. Uh, because it's the story about the two sons. One said he would go into the field and didn't, and the other one said he wouldn't, but did. Um, and uh, it would have been better to be the one who said he wouldn't, but did, than the one who said he would uh, and didn't do it. You see, we base our life on what people say. Um, well, in my company, if I say to somebody, please do that, and they say, fine, I'll do it, I go away thinking he's done it. If he hasn't done it, a whole bunch of other things that I might be doing might rely on the fact that I assumed he did that. Like, I'll give a silly example, like when I leave home uh, uh, and my children were younger, Andrew, please close the front door. We're just going on holiday. Did you close the front door? No, we're just catching the plane. And the front door's open for two weeks. You know, I'm relying on him to close the... Well, there's all sorts of other things like that. So our word is so important. Imagine if God didn't really mean what he said. If you couldn't rely on his word, where would we be? If, if, so God regards his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. We are children of God. Our word should be really, really important. And I can't say that enough, that that to me is a crucial element of business and church um, and when we say things in the church we really should do that that doesn't mean we shouldn't say hard things and sometimes we have to say hard things the bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend sometimes we have to make a hard word i remember listening to a lawyer recently uh, who had to uh, who was in a ministry uh, and uh, he had to get rid of somebody and uh, he just had said to this guy, he said, look, I want to tell you, you're a fantastic person, you've got a great ministry, the only thing is it isn't here. I thought it was a lovely way of letting him down. But, uh, and he said, the guy was really angry with him, but years later, he came back and thanked him and said, really, that, that was a point in my life when I made a reassessment of what I really wanted to do. And then he went on and did that. So uh, sometimes even doing... Hard, uh, giving hard words uh, can be uh, very productive and, uh, and helpful to people. They may not think so at the time. So, uh, even sometimes if it hurts, sometimes I've made a, a deal and the circumstances have changed. But at that point, let's say I promised to go somewhere and speak, uh, but my circumstances have changed, but I, I will still do it even though it's going to be a problem. Um, the only way you can get away with it, uh, get, uh, change your word, is A, if you're sick and you just can't make it, or B, if you ask permission. Uh, recently I was asked to do something and I said, look, I agreed to do it, I will come, I will do that on that date, but is it just possible that we could switch it to a week later, that would help me. But if you can't, it's okay, I'll still do it. And as it happens, uh, the, the person switched it. So. You know, keeping our word, integrity. And amongst Christians, it should not be that we don't have integrity. Um, because when people look at us, they should see a difference between us and the world. Um, so, don't promise something unless you can do it. Uh, I think we need to be fair in what we do. Uh, we need to be honest. Um, and, and business too. It, 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 what happens is when people are, see that you're honest, maybe it costs you a bit to start with, but when they see they'll, they'll do business with you. Very often I've managed to buy a property where somebody else bid some more than me. And they said, well, we think this chap will do what he said. 
we're worried about this bloke, he might at the last minute try and knock the price down. So we've done the deal um, for, uh, for a cheaper price. Um, one of the things I do, um, and I think we can do this in ministry too, is you see a man faithful in small things, you raise him up to greater. Um, and this is particularly true uh, when we're, we're a philanthropy organization, we support missions in different parts of the world, and sometimes we've had some serious disappointments uh, where people have pilfered the money or where people have taken the money and done something completely different to what we wanted. But we generally start small. And then when we prove that they can be trusted in small things, then we would go and do something bigger. And I think that's a, a good principle, not only in business, but, but in, in, in ministry too. Um, I can give you an example um, where, uh, for instance, the, the Incas in, Central, in America, a lot of them died of the common cold. And the reason they died of the cold is the, the people from Spain took uh, the germs with them and they had no immunity. And so when it comes to finance, when you're financing a ministry, let's say in Africa, the last thing you want to do is put a lot of money in front of them because you're creating a temptation. They don't have any immunity. And we've had some disappointments in that sense, but generally they've been small because we've only used a, a little amount. Um, so we can actually be corrupting them by putting a temptation in front of them that they're not familiar with. Um, you wouldn't, for instance, put an alcoholic working in a bar, would you? Uh, and so why would you want to put a lot of money in front of somebody who has never experienced that before? So uh, I think that's another thing, to use great sense and not cause our brothers to stumble. Um, you know, the master uh, in one of these parables returned unexpectedly and he found his servants doing all kinds of things that they shouldn't have been doing. I think that's a good business principle. Turn up when they're not expecting you. You know, well, don't, don't give them forewarning, I'm coming on such and such a day at such and such a time because everything will be fine. We sponsor three schools in England and we have about uh, 3,000 kids in these schools. Well, we used to know ahead of time when the school inspectors were coming. And I discovered to my horror that the head teachers made sure they got all the naughty kids and sent them on a day out. So that when the inspector came, all the kids were so well behaved and everything was wonderful. But actually it was a completely false picture. And now, of course, they don't do that. They just turn up and uh, you don't have a chance to send all the naughty kids away. And so you get a much better reading of what really is going on. So I think um, there's a saying, people don't do what they're expected to do, they do what they're inspected to do. And <laughs> I, I would suggest doing that. Um, I have a substantial organization, uh, more than a thousand people have worked for me at one time. And you know, I've got a line of command and people tell you things. And so by the time it gets to you from five levels down, it's completely different to what's actually happening. So occasionally I'll just go bypass the whole lot and talk to the guy on the ground floor. I might call, talk to the mechanic in the service workshop and I get a completely different picture of what's going on. And I think in any organization, that's a good thing. That's not downgrading your management. That's just actually having checks and balances in place. Um, by the way, I should tell you a course I once went on. One of the interesting things you learn in business, that you learn all things to do, and in ministry, the one thing you don't learn is the person opposite you could be lying. And, uh, you know, this, uh, th this is very interesting to me because I went on this course run by people from Scotland Yard and the customs officers, and they said there were certain ways you could tell if a person was lying. And I managed to catch two people in the company who were lying as a result of what I'd been taught. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll just share it with you. Uh, for instance, if I say to you, well, I'll say it to my wife, uh, I put it to you that you stole this. And she might come back and say, I never took it. Very interesting. I used the word stole, she used the word took. 
You see, a thief doesn't like to think of themselves as a thief. They like to think of themselves as they're really a reasonable person. Or she might say, I never borrowed it, or I never moved it. But they don't like to say, I never stole it. So that's one thing. It's interesting. They soften the word back to you. If you ever hear that. There's, there's also another thing that people do. They sometimes come and say, I swear on my mother's life, or something like that. Have you heard people say things like that? Or I, I, and the Bible says, don't have to do that. What that's an indication of is they're actually saying to you that my word is not good enough, so I have to swear on a greater authority. Whereas the innocent person will normally say, no, I didn't. Okay, Or they will tell you a reason why they couldn't. They'll say to you, well, I, I couldn't have, I wasn't in on Wednesday. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? They haven't told you I didn't do it. They're saying, I, I wasn't in on Wednesday. They gave you a reason why they couldn't do it. So quite interesting when you actually get into the psychology of it because as soon as they say, well, I wasn't, then where were you? You can now force them into detail. And when you force them into detail, you suddenly find there's three hours they can't explain. Uh, one more illustration. Uh, really, this wasn't the purpose of the talk, but I find it interesting. Um, is if they have a differential memory. So if, for instance, they can tell you exactly what they were doing on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, but they can't remember what they did on Wednesday. Problem. You know, that's a little pointer. None of these are absolutes, but they're pointers. But if, on the other hand, they can't tell you what they did on Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday, but they absolutely know what they did on Wednesday, then it's an alibi. Uh, do you see what I mean? So there's different... And this is the, the sort of techniques the, the police use. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're from time to time, we'll find those kind of issues crop up. And it's good to just be aware uh, that... Uh, and in business, we find it quite a lot. We have to be able to judge whether the person across from us is actually um, uh, telling us the truth or not. I often find that I check how somebody does treats other people. Because let's say they treat me very well because I'm their boss but just check how they're treating people at the same level. Or check how they're treating people at the level below. For instance, when I had people come for an interview, um, I'd often ask my secretary, how were they before they came in? Uh, were they nice to you? Oh, they, they just totally ignored me. They just sat there and didn't say a word. You know. So I think, oh, that's interesting. Um, I once had a guy come for an interview, and he he put his legs up on the table, feet on the table. And I thought, this is really curious. What, what am I going to do about this? So I thought, um, I will, I said to him, do you normally come to an interview and do this? Now, he had two choices. He could either take his legs off the table, or he could brazen it out uh, and carry on, <laughs> which is what he did. Of course, he never got the job. Um, and, and by the way, when you're interviewing people, um, they know the questions you're going to ask. Why are you here? Or why, uh, why are you leaving your previous job? All those questions we know they're going to ask. So they've already got all their answers, right? So you need to throw them. You can throw them a question they never, never even thought about. So all of a sudden, oh, what's, where did that come from? I had one lady come to me and I said to her, that's an unusual dress you're wearing. D did you make it yourself? And she said, well, yes, I did. Oh, how did you do that? And uh, so we got the discussion. Now she's forgotten all those fixed answers, you see. And then I asked her the question I wanted to ask her and, and got the answer. So we, we need to be wise in this because we're recruiting people and sometimes we need to know what their real heart is because they've come in with all the set answers and that's not what you want. You want to get to the heart of what is really motivating that person. Um, I don't know how many of you have got reasonable size organizations or those that are growing. My company started off with 60 people and we our first year's turnover was about a million pounds but then we grew and grew and grew and it's now about five or six hundred million pounds. But what happens in that process is you grow past the capability of certain people. This will happen with churches uh, where let's say you've got a very faithful uh, maybe a deacon or elder or a youth worker or whatever, 
but you're starting with a church of 50 people, and now you have a church of 500 um, or 5,000. What happens when you pass the capability of those people? They've been loyal to you. They've worked hard for you. Uh, they're really committed to it, but you've grown past their capability. And I had this with one of my uh, directors. He was a finance director. And um, he just couldn't handle the size of the company. Now, what do you do? Allow the company to stay down to the size he's capable of, or the church to stay to the size they're capable of, or do you grow past it? And I had some advice from a friend, and, and this was it. He said, you cannot allow them to stop you growing, but you have to recognize they're loyal. So, the first thing you ask yourself is, are they a good manager? Because if they're a good manager, you can put someone good under them who may be better than them, but they're good managers, okay? If they're not a good manager, then you have to build around them. In my case, what I did was I split it. I made him the company secretary, and I brought in a director of administration. So I put all the growth areas under the director of administration and, and left him doing that job. So I kept him in position. He said, but if they then start sniping at each other because they can't handle the fact that they're being, then you have no choice but to let them go for the sake of the, uh, the business or the ministry. So I just leave that with you as, um, uh, as, a, as a thought. Um, everything starts with vision. The Bible tells us without vision the people perish. I want to just um, write something up on the board. Uh, it's not my idea, it's a famous gentleman called Edwin Louis Cole. Has anybody heard of him? He was, uh, have you heard of him? Oh. Okay, he was a, a psychologist uh, who was a Christian. He used to speak to large stadiums full of about 50,000 men and uh, he was mainly a men's ministry. Um, and this is what he came up with. He said, everything in life goes through that process. Whether it's a, a guy interested in a girl, whether it's somebody starting a business, whether it's somebody uh, starting a church. The first thing is revelation. So, revelation is, guy sees girl and says, wow, okay, and, or somebody has an idea, I'd like to start a business uh, like this, or somebody, I, I want to start a church over in Lapland or somewhere. So, that, you've got this idea, okay? The next thing you do is you need to inspire. So, the guy with the girl, he says, should we go out and have a cup of coffee, or would you like to come out to dinner or the theater or something like that? Uh, with with the, the business, uh, you get a couple of guys together and say, oh, I've got this idea, why don't we form this sort of business? And uh, uh, with the church, same sort of thing, you say, I've got this idea, I want to have a church in Lapland, do you think you'd be willing to come with me? Okay, so you, you've got to inspire others. Uh, the third thing is formalization. In the case of the guy and the girl, the ring goes on the finger and you're now formally married. In the case of a business, you establish the business, you get your bank facilities in place. In the case of a church, you identify the place, you start putting up the building, and you start your church services. So that's all very good up to there, right? Now, the next thing is institutionalization. She does the washing up and makes the food. I mow the lawn and bring in the money. That's my job, that's her job. Uh, he's the deacon, he's the elder, I'm the pastor, here's the youth leader. And it starts to get uh, a little bit more than formalization, institutionalization, and the same with the business, marketing director, sales director, accountant, etc. What then naturally progresses is if you let that get too too solid, it becomes crystallized. You get crystallization. And she's sick in bed, but I'm not going to cook the food because that's her job. Or that sort of thing, do you see? Or in the, uh, uh, the, the 
marketing director is, is arguing with the sales director. It's his fault we never achieved the target. Sales director's saying to the marketing director, no, you did rubbish marketing, that's the problem. And in the church, the, the deacons and elders are falling out. Everything is, is sort of getting, and there's no, no movement, no, no, nobody's helping each other. So that, that sort of tends to happen. And finally, that becomes secularization, which is, in a marriage it's a divorce, in a business it's a bankruptcy, in a church it's a split. So he said, how do you overcome that? This is how you overcome it. When you're starting to go here, you go back for fresh revelation. In a business, you're going to launch a new product. You're going to go into a new market. In a church, you're going to have a new initiative. You're going to do something with uh, prisoners or drug rehabilitation, or you're going to open a branch work. You've got to have this constant flow of French re uh, fresh revelation. And in a marriage, maybe you say, well, let's take up a hobby. We play golf. Uh, not well, I have to say. But, um, or let's, uh, some kind of thing that we can do together, particularly uh, as circumstances in life change. So I find this a, a very good thing because if we see so many organizations that have continued on down there and it's ended, finished, churches, that, that really have never had any fresh revelation. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, I, I believe to be really important that we, we do that. You know, business, success is measured by money, how much you make. Um, although I heard somebody recently who talked about actually not just focusing on the financial side, but focusing on what you're trying to deliver. And he made the illustration between Apple and um, Microsoft. Microsoft, he went to the conference and spoke to them, and they were all the time thinking, we've got to beat Apple here, we've got to have a product that's better. All the time they were comparing themselves to Apple. When he went to the Apple conference, Apple was saying, we've got a vision so that people can communicate. And they were talking about vision all the time. Uh, Microsoft were just totally focused on how can they beat Apple. And I think we should always keep vision in mind. When my son took over the business, I said to him, Andrew, uh, let me tell you, 50% of your time is going to be spent dealing with people issues. And I think in pastoral ministry, uh, it's probably more than 50%. Well, anyhow, after he took it over, he said, Dad, I think that was an underestimate. Uh, because if you can get the right people in the right situation and motivate them, you'll have a very successful organization, whatever it happens to be. I have the view, right people equals right result. Wrong people equals wrong result. So if you've got the wrong result happening, time, you know, occasionally people make mistakes, but if consistently you're getting the wrong result, you have to question whether you've got the right people. Um, you know, in most organizations, they don't have uh, everybody right. But if you've got something like 55, 60, 70 percent, you've got a very successful organization. You see, in every organization, there's probably four different types of people. There's the ones that are high energy and positive, great people. They're the ones who are going to go out and break ground and open new uh, op operations for you. They're fantastic people to have. So high energy, positive. Then you have low energy, positive. Well, they're okay. You need people to do the filing and greet people at, at the door, but they're not necessarily going to go uh, turn the world over for you, but you need them, and every organization has them. But then you also have the others, high energy, negative. They are effectively the terrorists in your organization. They're the people who are going to cause you serious harm. Um, and then you have low energy, negative. Well, obviously you need to do something about that. If you've got high energy, negative, that person has either got to be turned around to be high energy positive, or he's got to be uh, sent out of the organization. Um, the low energy negative, they're probably not doing you too much harm, but it'd be good if they were a bit more positive. So try and give them some more positive influences. Um, I guess you've all got people in your organizations that are always moaning and complaining. 
Have you? Has anybody got people in there? And I, th I think it's like uh, it just gradually drains the organisation if there's all this negativity around. Um, and I, I usually uh, view it in three ways. If a person's like that, they've, they've either got to come to terms with it and become positive, or they've got to leave. A third thing is what, what most people do, which is stay and complain. And that's the worst thing of the lot. You, you, you need them either to become positive or to leave, but to stay and complain is just disruptive of the organization. So those kind of people you need to get out of the organization if, if you can't turn them around. There's, there's loyalty and there's competence. Of course, we all want good, competent people, but I like loyal people too. And because I think with uh, talent, it's got legs, and talent walks. You know, like for instance, if you've got a, uh, a person who's in, when we had Y2K, uh, you remember when, uh, the year 2000, I had a lot of my uh, IT people up and go because everyone was after IT people. And, uh, but the ones who were loyal stayed and they took a long-term view that they loved working for the company. But So talent alone, it's great to have it, but you need loyalty too, and I look for that in my people. Um, so um, I would say, interestingly, when you watch what Jesus did, um, he didn't choose people based on competence. The fishermen were, didn't have any ministry competence. And actually, he was much more interested in their character and their loyalty. I remember when he saw Nathaniel coming towards him, he said, here's a Jew in whom there is no guile. Actually, Jesus saw his character before he, he looked at his capability. Um, and, you know, uh, I think there's... Um, I'll find it in a minute. I've got to put my glasses on. There's a little saying which I wanted to report to, uh, repeat to you. Um, you know, a lot of people who we would see as qualified are not necessarily the best people. Uh, in fact, many great ministries have rejected the people who, for instance, Gladys Aylward, have you heard of her? She went, uh, went to China. A mission society rejected her. Uh, Reinhard Bonnke was not accepted by his German mission society, and yet he was seeing eight million people um, receive Christ in Africa every year. So very often, um, we're looking at the outward appearance, but God's looking at the heart. And, and somehow or other, when we're choosing our people, we need to uh, try and get past that outward appearance. Um, you know, you could perhaps question some of Jesus' choices. He chose Judas. Um, how did that happen? If he knew Judas's character, he knew all along what Judas w would end up uh, doing. Uh, and he must have been aware that Judas was taking money out of the bag. And when uh, the alabaster box was broken on Jesus' feet, um, we see that Judas was the one who complained. So money was his thing. Why did Jesus choose him? I guess Jesus knew he had to be betrayed. But anyhow, I find that curious. But the other 11, even though when he died, one betrayed him, uh, one, uh, one deserted him, uh, sorry, they all deserted him, uh, and one denied him, you would think he hadn't made a very good choice. But I think Jesus could see past that to their character, and all of them, except John, ended up giving their lives for him, of course, not including Judas. So Jesus chose on a totally different criteria to what we do. Um, and actually, when I started my company, which was very small, um, the people I had were all loyal, great people, and uh, they were the ones who took it on. But then some of them, it passed their capability, but they were uh, big enough to accept that the company could continue to grow. So when you're choosing people, I think you should sell the vision. Uh, I think it's interesting when you talk to people, what do they come alight 
Well, if, if you talk to them about a specific subject, what makes them really come alive? I remember somebody I was talking to, I was telling them about the business and what have you, then I was telling them about the ministry, and he said, you really come alive when you start talking about the ministry, because actually that's my passion. Um, I've already done a, a, a number of speeches here on that, so this one, I'm afraid you've got the boring one, which is the business one. But um, yeah, that's my passion, is to use all my uh, capabilities, all the resources I have to push forward the gospel. And I use business principles. Let me uh, give you an example of uh, one. Um, for instance, if your church wanted to send a missionary to Mozambique, uh, how would you do it? Probably, uh, if you were a church pastor, you'd be thinking, who in our congregation would want to go to Mozambique? And you'd ask for a volunteer, maybe you'd get one. And if you got one, you'd send them off to Maputo, uh, which is the capital of Mozambique, and you'd be, um, They'd be there three years learning the language and the kids would have to go to uh, the English-speaking school or whatever. But as a business person, I thought about it completely different. Here's a problem. What is the solution to that problem? There's 40 million evangelicals in Brazil. They all speak Portuguese. They live in an area where there's mosquitoes and hot weather and all sorts of problems, just the same as Mozambique. So we took a hundred of them and sent them to Mozambique. And when we took that hundred there, they hit the ground running. They got the border guards converted on the way through. My wife was there, um, basically trying to fill out the forms because she doesn't speak Portuguese, and try to get them through. And, and there she looks around over the shoulder, and there's the border guards on their knees, and these guys are praying for them. Um, and they did a fantastic job. They planted 300 churches in the space of about seven years and trained up nationals, and we handed it over. You see, it's a different way of looking at things. And I think we can be very businesslike in our approach and not go down the conventional line of saying, we'll send one person from our church. Let's think globally. Let's think um, uh, much bigger. Uh, and uh, so that was a really exciting project anyhow. And we've done a number of them. Um, Another thing I really look for is enthusiasm. Uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that says that without enthusiasm, you can't achieve anything. And you've got to have enthusiasm. And uh, God doesn't use disillusioned people. He, he, you know, he uses people who are enthusiastic. And, and uh, if we're in the right place, uh, we, we, we need to have enthusiastic, motivated people. There was a, a story about Dale Carnegie and Pullman. They were both uh, had train lines uh, in, America, in Canada, and the competition was killing each other. And uh, they decided to have a dinner together. And at the end of the dinner, uh, it looked like they were going to do a deal and merge. But Carnegie had to understand what was going on in the mind of the other guy. And he knew that he was very proud of his own name. And so at the end of it, the deal was nearly done, but the final question came. What will we call the company? And Carnegie immediately responded, the Pullman Coach Car Company, of course. And the deal was done. So we have to understand where other people are coming from. And I, I, I think it's great to get into the mind of other people. I, I look at the Bible very often from the reverse side. Um, and, and, and try and analyze why does it say that. There, there's one expression in the Bible that says, despise not prophesying. Why does it say that? They must have been. Why were they despising prophecy? Probably they had a bunch of people making kooky prophecies. And we, we experience the same today, don't we, sometimes? And, but the Bible says, don't despise it, test it. Uh, and, and the same... Uh, with everything, like for instance, I've had a few bad experiences with our philanthropy where the money's been uh, abused. But the scripture says, grow not weary in well-doing. Why does it say that? They must have been. Um, why were they growing weary in well-doing? Because probably they sometimes got abused and, and misused. And we mustn't allow that to stop us doing things just because we have disappointments. Jesus had plenty of disappointments. Look, look when uh, Peter denied him, when Judas betrayed him. But did that stop him? So my view is I exercise as much diligence as I can 
when I'm dealing with charitable things and make sure I but once I get to the point that I've donated the money it's then no longer my responsibility it's their responsibility to answer to God for what they do and if they abuse it okay it's their problem but I'm not going to stop doing it because otherwise who wins the devil uh, and we don't want that to happen um, another thing I'd like to say is information is power uh, if you have good information, you can make good decisions. If you have bad information, you can only make a bad decision. If you know how, have no information, you're probably not going to make any decision. Um, so information is power. I don't know if you heard the story of how the Rothschilds people made a lot of money. What happened, there was the Napoleonic War, and Rothschilds had a messenger over there, this was before the days of emails and telegrams and all the rest of it, and he caught the last boat back to England before the next, and that day they did it, all kinds of financial transactions, and then the news arrived that the war had been won by the British against the, the French in that time, and uh, suddenly all these things he'd done went up in value. Information is power, and I think uh, we, we know the scripture of the, the prophet who used to keep telling the king, oh, the, the king of Syria is going to attack you here. And, and then suddenly went there and uh, it, there was nothing there. Um, and so God is able to speak to us and give us insights and information. I have to say, a couple of times in my business career, God's actually told me precisely what's going to happen before it happened. And one time I rang the bank and I said, I'm going to do this in the morning, I'm going to do that in the afternoon. And uh, um, when it happened, they were just amazed. Uh, but sometimes I think God just can speak into our heart. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter how much money we have. So in terms of my charity and that, because unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Um, if you look at the story in, in, in the Bible about Ahithophel, you know, Ahithophel was the grandfather, I think, of Bathsheba. He had every reason to hate David. And, but he was David's greatest advisor. And when uh, David had to run away, Ahithophel was counseling uh, Absalom. And he said, a man mine equal has risen up against me. Uh, Ahithophel, it said, when he spoke, it was like the words of God. He was so knowledgeable, and so it was like the oracle of God when Ahithophel spoke. And you would have thought, given that, David would have been really concerned, and I think he was. But the interesting thing was, even though Ahithophel gave the right advice, he said, go after him straight away and capture David straight away, even though he had the, the, the most incredible wisdom and advice, God was able to turn it, the, the, uh, Absalom ignored his advice. And so, and Ahithophel, which was very interesting, he jumped on his donkey and went home and hanged himself. The battle hadn't even been hung. I think I might have waited to see if I was wrong. But Ahithophel was so knowledgeable, he, he, he hung himself straight away. So, um, we have to, even no matter how clever we are, no matter how good we are at following all these principles, at the end of the day, unless the Lord build a house, we labor in vain. We have no excuse not to use all the diligence we have, all the knowledge and wisdom we have, because we are called to be wise. Scripture says, wisdom is justified of all her children. I love that expression, because it says, to the wise, wisdom is wisdom. To the fool, wisdom is foolishness. And as Christians, our wisdom is regarded as foolishness to the world.